Well, we're the last session of the day, so that means we're standing between you and food or drinks or something. So uh, we may not we may not go the whole time if we don't need to go the whole time. Um, so this open textbook pilot study, we want to report on data um, from last year from the so this is 11, 12, so it would have been the 10, 11 <coughs> um, school year. This is a partnership between uh, the State Office of Education and Tiffany Hall will probably wander in here at some point, as well as uh, John Hilton and myself at BYU. Um, and if you were there for the keynotes this morning, you already heard Superintendent Shumway uh, make some reference to this. So I just want to describe the pilot, describe uh, what we found and where we are currently in this process. So Utah... Utah's approach to textbooks is that uh, we, we do not have a mandatory list that's maintained by the state that every school has to adopt from. We have a database of recommended instructional materials um, that textbooks get uh, vetted and reviewed for and then are approved to be used as a primary resource in the text room or as a supplementary or a limited resource in the text room, in the classroom. It's been a long day. Um, and so districts are actually free to do essentially anything they want to do. They can choose a book off of the recommend, out of RIMS, out of the instru uh, recommended instructional materials list, or a district can say, we want to do something else, and then the district is just responsible for documenting the process they went through to decide to make that choice as opposed to choosing something off of the recommended instructional materials list. Now, uh, this pilot we've been doing uh, in the context of science uh, and science textbooks in high schools, and so one of the things that we did was just went through and looked at every book in every science category, at the, uh, grades 9 to 12, and just found what is the average cost of all the books in the, in the RIMS database. And so you can see that uh, through some happy circumstance, the average cost of a science textbook is exactly $75 uh, in what's in RIMS currently today. Now this is, a, particularly in the context of K-12 budgets, this is a relatively high cost. Uh, and that high cost has some impacts. The first is that when a high school buys a textbook, they typically buy that book and then they hold on to it for a number of years. Um, we've heard numbers in the five to seven range as we've talked to people here in Utah. Um, when you take a book and you hold on to it for seven years and you hand it down from generation to generation to generation to generation on seven times of students, you, know, you end up with books that are out of date, uh, obviously by the end of that process. Books that are in very poor physical condition uh, typically, if you're the fifth or sixth or seventh student uh, to receive one of these. But a bigger problem pedagogically for these books is because they have to live a seven-year life. Is that as a matter of policy, you tell the students, you, you may not deface this book in any way. Under no circumstances do I be highlighting in it, or writing in it, or taking notes, or drawing pictures, or anything like that. Because other students have to come along after you and use this book. Uh, and so one of the impacts of high cost that we don't typically think about in higher ed, I mean, it's hard for me to remember what was happening earlier this morning, let alone what was happening in high school, to know that I wasn't allowed to write in any of my textbooks. And now trying to imagine studying without being able to highlight or note take or do any of those kinds of things um, is a challenging thing to imagine. And also because the, the cost of these books are so high, uh, it's not uncommon to see this approach of someone just buying a classroom set and putting 35 or 40 books at the back of the room and then saying, okay, now we're gonna use the textbook. Everybody go grab a book off the shelf and now we'll read something for a minute and I'll put them all back in a situation where a student can't take a book home um, even to read you know, in the evening or over the weekend. And we want to feature prominently uh, Tiffany who's walked into the room now, actually just an opportunity to embarrass you. So, yeah. um, so the, the, the high cost of these textbooks have, have a variety of impacts. I suppose I don't have to say too much to this group about open textbooks. Um, but, you know, they are free and legal to download, to revise, to adapt, redistribute. The, the, the four R's we call these, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute. Um, they're traditionally distributed in digital formats, so they're available, uh, you know, to be used on an iPad or a netbook or something like that. Um, but even though they're distributed digitally, originally you can take, of course, and run these through a print-on-demand process so that kids who want a paper book or a teacher who wants a paper book um, not only gets access to a paper book, but gets access to a paper book uh, through a process of going out and finding who will, who will print this book for me the cheapest and being able to kind of shop around and get a good price uh, on the printed version of their open textbook. So specifically about the Utah Open Textbook Pilot Program, this was originally 
uh, funded and uh, ongoing funding has come from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and also there's time that's been contributed from BYU in support of the initiative. Um, we started this process by going to CK12 and did Nehru make it into the room? Okay. Um, how many of you know CK12? If you don't know CK12 and you work in the public school space at all, you should go check this out because they provide a wide range of books in math, science, pre-engineering, and uh, technology. Um, on math now, as far down as grade six, up all the way through high school. So it's a complete set. In the case of science, of course, of earth science, uh, biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, the teachers that were participating in, in the pilot were earth systems, chemistry, and biology teachers. We didn't have a physics teacher in the original pilot. Um, so we identified these textbooks, and we had a very interesting conversation with, um, at least it was really interesting to, for me because it didn't go the way I thought it would go. But Tiffany and I sat down with the curriculum uh, coordinators from some of the districts in what's called the BYU Public School Partnership. It's five districts that we have an ongoing partnership with, uh, that BYU works together with. And I thought we could tell them, hey, there are these books that you could use that you could save a lot of money, kind of to Jim's point earlier this morning. They said, well, yeah, I think we could save money, but you're missing the point that if these books were really this inexpensive to print, um, that opens up a whole new range of things that we could do with these books that we haven't been able to do, to do in the past. So after some buy-in uh, from, from that uh, district curriculum coordinator level, we got teachers together, uh, again, using uh, funding from the Hewlett Foundation, got them together to do some professional development to teach them what OER are, that yes, it's okay to edit and adapt and tear parts out and make changes. Um, and also some technical training on the CK12 system so they knew how to use their editor to actually make the changes that they wanted to make to the book. So we ran this process over the summer. They met and revised these books. And the majority of the revisions were really just pulling out things that either they don't cover, aren't part of Utah standards, or something that the teacher already had, a great thing that they did in the classroom to teach that, that they didn't need that to be in the book, um, and pulled out a bunch of this material that uh, was essentially irrelevant for their purposes. So phase one, this is 10-11, we had seven teachers and 1,200 students um, in that group. And two things, we, we learned a lot about trying to affordably print open textbooks. Um, and this is all covered in quite a bit of detail in a paper that's forthcoming that, uh, that we've got written up on, on this that covers the cost figures in some detail. But we let the teachers basically be free to try a number of things. So some teachers printed uh, the books on loose leaf paper that was three hole punched to go into a three ring binder. And some uh, sent, uh, wanted to do print on demand through a service like Lulu that would generate a real honest to goodness paperback book uh, and things like that. And what we found was that there are a wide range of ways to print open textbooks that are much more expensive than just buying a traditional book. <laughs> <laughs> we learned this lesson firsthand. But until you get out and try, you know, you're never going to know. But we did learn some things about ways to actually make this process work uh, very well, which we'll talk about. And we do have some efficacy data. Because one of the things that uh, we included in our initial, uh, initial proposal with the Hewlett Foundation was that anybody will believe that you can go find some free stuff on the internet and download it and print it off for five bucks, I'm sure. But you get what you pay for. Your student outcome, your learning outcomes are just going to tank. Um, so we've got to track and figure out what the impact on student learning is. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And I did want to say that um, we had a very successful phase one in terms of teacher attitudes and student outcomes. And for phase two, we've gone essentially district-wide in the Nebo district here in Utah with over 20 teachers and 2,700 students. And we've, we took all the lessons that we learned about print costs in the first year about what not to do and what to do and we're able to uh, purchase textbooks at the following cost this year for those 2,700 students. So these prices, um, these prices don't include shipping. Uh, but when you add the shipping cost here, the average cost for one of these books that we use this past year is $5.35 for a primary, uh, you know, the primary text for a science class, a, a year-long biology or chemistry or earth systems class. So I think we have, I think it's safe to say that we've absolutely cracked the nut on the price part of how to use open textbooks. And this does not include people that already have netbooks or iPads in their classrooms that just used the digital version that covered 200 kids and didn't incur any cost at all. Those people aren't included in these figures. Um, if we included, you know, those extra students and divided by what we paid to print, obviously the, 
the cost of using these open textbooks would be lower. And we, we, you know, we don't have anybody in, in physics currently. So one way to think about this in terms of price comparison is to think, if you buy a $75 or an $80 book and you keep it for seven years, what are you spending per year on that book? Or if you only keep it for five years, what are you spending per year for that book? And if you use the open book, what are you spending per year for that book? So I think these comparisons are pretty interesting and pretty compelling to say that even on a seven-year cycle, you know, you're saving over 50%. Um, and of course, you're saving a lot more if you're just on a five-year cycle. Um, if, you, if you look at this uh, between the lows and the highs, we're saving somewhere between $5.40 and $10.30 and per book per year. Right? Because in this model, we're going to print a new book every year. The next group of kids comes in, I'm going to print another book and hand it to you and say, that book is yours, you can keep it, you can highlight in it. It belongs to you. Knock yourself out. And uh, with, with over 150,000 students uh, in, the, uh, in grades 9 through 12 doing science in the state of Utah, if you take this range and do the multiplication, we're somewhere, uh, once this goes statewide, we're talking about saving somewhere between 800,000 and 1.5 million a year. So the financial impact on the state um, will be very real. The, the impact is already very real. We've shown this loud and clear. This is great. So this is a good finding. Uh, so financial benefits. To talk about pedagogical benefits for a second, um, well, this is just a bit of what I was saying, isn't it? Each student gets a brand new book every year. They put their name on it. They keep it forever. They are allowed to highlight. They are allowed to annotate. They can take notes directly in the book. They can take it home over the weekend to study and read. Yeah. Some of you might have heard this earlier, but Tiffany's just has a fun anecdote to share. Tiffany, do you mind telling this little story? <laughs> yeah, you got to share this. So I was sitting at a football game, and my stepson is the kicker, and he's new, so he's not very good. So he doesn't kick a lot. So it's not as if we have to be very involved. And, and the way the football stadiums are set up is you always put the visitors facing the sun. So we decided we'd sit on the home side so we wouldn't have to face into the sun. Because he's only going to kick once, and it doesn't matter. And um, in fact, he might not even kick that game. But I got to talk to parents. And so I was sitting next to a parent um, who had uh, several children who had gone through and had one, one son, his youngest son, who was in biology, and I said, oh, you know, I just hear that the Nebo district is at the cutting edge. Corey, are you hearing me say this? Yeah, what so. <laughs> Nebo district is just on the cutting edge. They do some really amazing things in science. Who does your son have this year for science? Well, he has Mr. Blake. Oh, I say, he has biology. Yes, he does. And the dad looks at me and says, and you know what? He's got a book this year, and he gets to bring it home, and I want to know how come my other kids didn't have Strangely enough, I can answer that question. <laughs> 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 you that way or anything. Um, but I just kind of, you know, I talked to him and I said, well, what, what do you see your son doing differently in this biology class that your other two or three sons, several of them, <coughs> all just kind of big kids running around the football field, that they didn't do? And he said, my child brings the book home and he writes in it. It's just like when I was in college. He highlights stuff um, and only what's important is in the book, and he brings it home, and it doesn't weigh 500 pounds, so he can just leave it in his backpack. You never have to go back to the school to get the homework book. The, the, you know, his parent perception is always one of our concerns whenever we try something like this. Well, they look at this soft-bound book that isn't printed in color, um, you know, isn't perfect and glossy and shiny like the ones from the big publishers are, a big McGraw-Hill book that costs $80 or something. And well, they think that their child is getting a lesser education, and the, the opposite was actually the fact where he really viewed that as, my child has a resource that my other kids didn't have, and I see that it's making a difference in his interest in biology, his ability to do his homework, and how engaged he is with the text. So I thought that was really good to, to have that conversation. I mean, do you go to a football game expecting the person next to you to say, you know, my kid can write in his book? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not the conversation you're expecting to have in football. That, thank you for, for bringing that up, because that's a really fun story. Um, so on the professional development side, I want to say that there are a handful of things that are really super important, several of which we did not do in the first year, just because we were running as fast as we possibly could, trying to uh, keep things working and running. We did get the teachers together and we did talk to them about what openness means. We gave them the technical training on how to use the platform. 
But we never, so, you know, so we did deal with helping them understand that they can make use of the 4R permissions that they have in the books. But we didn't go out of our way to tell them about any of the new pedagogical possibilities that they really ought to be thinking about, different things that they could do, different things that they ought to do, or, and, you know, uh, Tiffany's, uh, one of Tiffany's areas of expertise is in literacy. And uh, do, you, do you want to say a little bit about the science literacy kind of possibilities here? Well, we just, we ran out of time. We just didn't, didn't have time to do everything we wanted to, but we really wanted to talk with some of, uh, you know, with them and help them understand how to use these books to help teach science literacy, to help teach, um, you know, since they can touch the paper, you know, how do you read charts and graphs? How do you really begin to understand a science text? How do you transfer that into your labs and activities? How do you transfer information from your labs and activities? back to your study of a science textbook. Um, we didn't really have a chance to do that in the first year. The second year, with the much wider scope of people, we have two things going for us. Um, we have several science teachers who are in the second year of the pilot who have uh, specialized in science literacy. So they are already ahead of us in that regard. And the second thing is that this is the year that uh, the state of Utah is going to adopt the science, well not adopt, but begin to gear up our common core state standards in science and science literacy. And so we're hoping to be able to find some connections between that um, and being able to have these textbooks that the teachers can have. So, so in terms, when we think about the learning impact, which are the, the next couple of slides I'm going to show before I wrap up, we really didn't have an opportunity to do any professional development at all. We essentially said, you had this book before, uh, take this other book, and just do whatever you did before, just do the same thing, just use this book instead. Yes, we know it's paperback. Yes, we know it's black and white. Yes, we know it's not glossy paper. All these kind of surface features that you think are the things that go into making a good textbook, but it's 1,400 pages long and hardback and whatever. So we really didn't have a chance to do any of that training. We just kind of swapped out books and said, do whatever you do. So I want to look at the, the learning impact. These are uh, graphs for these seven teachers. This is the pilot year. These are changes in the percentage of students that uh, demonstrated proficiency on the state standardized test at the end of the year. So 2011, this is the group of kids that took the exam that had used the open textbooks. And then we compared them to kids in the same teacher's classrooms uh, for two or three years before, oh, I'm sorry, one or two years before, depending on how many years of data we could get access to. So we can kind of control for teacher factors, kind of control for the types of kids that are in the school. Same types of kids, exact same teacher, teaching the same class. All we've done is change the textbook. And so what you see is you see, well, this guy was 100, and he dipped all the way to 99 the year before, and he was back to 100 with the open textbook. But essentially, you see you know, one person staying the same, a couple of downward trends, a couple of upward trends. When you throw this all into a pot and just do some descriptive statistics on it, you know, what do we find? Well, you can talk about you know, central tendencies in these distributions a couple of different ways. If we talk about the mean uh, change across these seven teachers, there are 3% more students that were proficient uh, in 2011 than the average of the years before. If we talk about the median of the distribution, it's 1% lower. So essentially, basically no change across the group. Uh, three up, one down. Um, basically, they've maintained, as a group, kind of maintained uh, where they were in terms of learning outcomes. So to bundle all this up in a summary, I think what we did show in the first year of the pilot, which was admittedly smaller uh, than it might be, but still 1,200 kids is not bad, um, really significant cost savings, um, the ability to maintain learning outcome levels, and that's without any PD at all. Um, and then we've started to understand what the new pedagogical opportunities are, and we want to share that now with teachers going forward and see if we can actually move the learning outcomes up at the same time that we're holding the costs down. And I do also want to put a plug in to say that if you have an interest in Common Core math, you know, we're in our second year of this science piece now, but we've also been having really interesting conversations with people at the state office just in the last, what, seven wow. days? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I mean something. It's, uh, it, it, uh, anyway, our, our plan now in Utah is to take what we've been learning in science and start to take it over into math, into Common Core as well. And I think if you heard the superintendent's, superintendent's enthusiasm this morning as he talked about some of this, we just have great support. 
uh, leadership-wise of the state office from the superintendent down to the woman that owns, uh, for example, math and science curriculum, to Tiffany, to everybody on that side. And of course, we're really committed at BYU. So I think they're really great things to come. And uh, I think I've saved us a little time. So we could do some questions or possibly even end early. Now, Corey, what question could you possibly have? I have a comment. You're in Nebo District. I have a comment. <laughs> Uh, I'm the instructional technology specialist for New so it's kind of my responsibility to monitor these teachers and handle the technology needs. And I think going into this project, it's uh, when we started off, the intent was never to save money. The intent was to be twofold there. One was to re channel money into technology. I don't need textbooks, I can buy laptops, I can buy iPads. And two, in fact, I'll have to, so it's going to save money. And two, uh, we want to build a capabilities of our teachers to be able to teach with uh, online resources and find, force them to go find things and adapt things and things like that. And because of the success of the program in that first year and continuing into the second year, uh, the, the whole district is saying this is the way to go across the board. Uh, obviously there's some teachers that are never going to get there, but the district administration is on board. It's the way. Well, it worked out. That last point of yours of pedagogical possibilities, I think, is part of that. And it's, it's important, I have to make a plug for Corey. You know, we've got CK 12 giving us science, math, pre engineering. Corey needs social studies. I need social studies. <laughs> if, you know about, if you know anything about collections of high school age appropriate social studies OER, please, please, please come either tackle me or Corey when this presentation is over. Because they really are. They're ready to just go as fast as we can find appropriate content. But Corey also makes a really, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Corey makes an excellent point in, is that the district administration got behind it. And Corey has spent hundreds of extra hours working with firewalls and making sure that the iPods could talk. And the first year, we, you know, we kind of worked with kids being able to highlight and come back in their iPads and, and read and have their same notes. And it didn't work. And it would kick them out. And, you know, Standing in the hallway to try and get a connection. For the yeah, and so it was, it was a district commitment, and it was having a champion like Corey who was like, "What? You want to quadruple my workload? Bring it on!" I mean, you know, it was really um, the district that was ready, and that's one of you know the things that as you're going to expand and to look at this, you really have to say, "Are there going to be people at the district level, from the superintendent on down, and especially the people who are going to actually help?" Make sure that the technology is teacher and student driven and not driven from some kind of policy piece that doesn't connect to what happens in the classroom because that's really critical to, to letting people like this happen. Sure. This is a very commendable project you're doing, it's very impressive. Um, I'm curious about a feedback loop. Uh, since you're so hands on, you really connect with the students, it's not like some you know company out there that just ships you the books and they made their money and hopefully you're happy. Do you have a feedback loop where you maybe get focus groups of the students because they write in that they could really connect with the material to kind of see what worked for them and what would they recommend mm -hmm. and that type of stuff? Yeah, so we didn't in the first year, but thankfully this year we've got a master's student who's taking on that piece of the research as a master's thesis project. Mm -hmm. So we so we are gearing up to do that, but I don't have anything to talk about in the regard other than that we finally found the graduate student who's willing to, you know, kind of own that and, and do it. Excellent. So that's exciting. And I, you know, next year, hopefully, we'll have interesting things to say about that. We're like four minutes away. So we can quit early, or you can raise your hand. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Go for it. Just a quick, quick question on yeah. uh, what the estimated PD cost was to develop the curriculum for the, you know, the added time for the teachers. Um, so I think the... So, okay, so I'm laughing because part of our um, informal analysis of how this played out is that there's a boy model and there's a girl model of uh, how this got done. Now, keep in mind that on the PD side, you're just talking about the technical training to do the adaptation and things, not the pedagogical stuff. Um, so the short answer to your question is that the average was about 60 hours, is what each team put in, to go from, and uh, this is an important part that I didn't address, I, I think now in retrospect, to take these books from 1,200, 1,400, very typical kind of science books like you're used to, and get them down to 250, 225 page, really customized, tailored books, where we're not printing anything that we don't need. Um, 
and, and it was really striking that across all the tables, it was almost exactly 60 hours for chemistry, for biology, for Earth systems. What, what we found that really made us chuckle, uh, chuckle a little bit was that the approach, if I can say boys and girls, the approach that the girls in the, in the group took was they spent, uh, I, we met, we just talked about this, I think we met on the first time on July 1st, or sometime that first week of July. And all the, the, the girl teams, but particularly chemistry, had everything completely done, completely revised, back to a sweet print of a book, uh, Lulu, you know, uh, print on demand, and they used it in school that year. Like, the first time they heard of OER was the first week of July, and they were using books that year. The boys took the approach of, well, let's just print the whole book, and as we go through the book this year, I'll just mark out the stuff that I know I don't want next time. And uh, so they spent almost no time up front, and then at the back, you know, at the end of the year, went back through all their notes and said, okay, we don't need that, don't need that, went into the digital, uh, went into the system, pulled it all out, ended up taking about 60 hours uh, again uh, by the time it was all said and done. This is interesting to watch, you know, the different MOs of the, 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 the different gender groups that we have. Um, but so depending on what you pay your teachers for PD, I think we're using $30 an hour, I think is what, what we were paying, that Hewlett Foundation was supporting, so you say, 60 hours all in, including the days that we had them there for two days and whatnot. So, you know, you're a little under 2,000 in on the, on the adaptation side. And when you buy, you know, 1,200 books each year for several years, by the time you amortize that across, you know, all your books, it, it, it's pennies on the book. There's also people in the state who do, or in the districts who do that stuff with textbooks anyway, you know, like the setting and all that kind of stuff, so it's not like... Uh... You know, yeah, no, it's not like this an entirely new process that was never paid for before, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, some of that you've got to do one way or another where you choose, a, whether you choose a proprietary book or an open one. And many of them added common informative assessments that their departments had already developed, and then they put into the book, and those had already been developed. You know, so it was just, you know, it's not like it's new to the system. Yeah. 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 One more question, maybe? When you, when you measure, so, so in that in that graph where you were showing the test scores, you were showing percent proficiency. Right. Um, that's the y-axis. Um, it just struck me that it would be interesting to see actually how the, the distribution of scores changed. Because one of the things that you might hypothesize is that actually um, kids at the lower end of the distribution might benefit more from having, the most. Uh, yeah. um, from having access to a textbook, they didn't have access to that they could take home, that they take home, they yeah. have more access. You know, whereas, whereas kids at the upper end of the dis you know, distribution are probably wealthier kids who have more access to resources anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, so in fact, you might see that you know, even if you're not getting more kids to proficiency in one year, that you're that you're still having kids that have a better science understanding. Of the yeah, yeah. And, and what did Purple Teacher here do? You know, purple teacher was kind of flat for two years and then jumped 23 percentage points in the year that that person adopted an open book. What the heck went on in that classroom? You know, I mean, I'd, I'd like to understand that. The course. teacher has far more impact than the text. And so I think that the jumps and the drops are the teacher's ability to use these new materials. And as they become better to use these materials, you're just going to see that go back up. Yeah, and which again comes back to PD. We gave them no PD at all, right? We handed them a new book a week before school started and said, just do what you always did, just use this book instead of the other one. And and just the fact that they didn't all just fall off a cliff at the end. You should have. There should have been an innovator's drop. I mean, yeah. like a first year reasonable point. hypothesis would be that they would all do worse because it's different than not what they expected. Right, because it's this J curve of innovation, right, where you have to get used to it first and then you don't see the returns until second or third year, which is not what we, you know. I mean, you can see a little bit of that at individuals, but across the group, literally no change, right? Um, you know, with either plus three or minus one, no matter how you look at that, that's, zero. that's no significant difference. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, that, now we're one minute over. Thank you very much.